Hey there, it's Jason Gorman from Codemanship with the second part of the fifth in our series on test-driven development in Java. In the first part of this, we talked about inside-out test-driven development, where we we test drove the parts, pieces of the jigsaw, if you like, of our implementation, and then put them together at the end to satisfy our end user's requirement. And we looked at some of the advantages and disadvantages of that approach. The advantage was that um, our tests neatly pinpointed exactly where in our internal design the problem was when our tests failed. But it had some drawbacks. First of all, it exposed our test code to, to many details of the internal design. So our, our test code was tightly coupled to the implementation design. And that would mean that if we wanted to refactor or change that implementation design later, it would make it quite a bit harder. Um, and the other disadvantage was the risk is when we, we test drive pieces of a jigsaw and then try to put the jigsaw together at the end, the individual pieces don't actually fit and we don't end up satisfying our, our customer's requirement. In this second part, I want to talk about a different approach. We're going to come at it from the outside in. So in our Mars Rover example that we're still using, the, the kind of the API to our Mars Rover is a method called Go that accepts a sequence of character instructions, R for turning left, L for turning right, F for forward, and B for back. So you'll see here in this, this second attempt, all my tests are written at that level. They're all basically going through that API, going through that Go method, and we're not exposing internal methods for turning left or turning right. So I've done two tests and I've got an implementation that looks like this. And what we can see in our implementation is there's, so there's some very obvious duplication here. Now, if you remember from the fourth video in the series, and if you've not seen the previous videos, I highly recommend taking a look at those later. There'll be a link in the description below. Um, we talk about duplication and we talk about the rule of three, that we don't want to jump in too early before we remove duplication. And we tend to find that on average, seeing three examples of duplication is kind of the sweet spot so that we're not risking refactoring it and generalizing before we've really seen the pattern. Um, now, in this case, I think the pattern is very obvious and there are only going to be these two examples. There's only left and right. So in this case, I think I am going to refactor it to um, get rid of the duplication, but more importantly, to start actually cleaning up this design and self-documenting it. So we've got a block of code here, really, for turning right. and We've got a block of code here for turning left. But it might not be immediately obvious what those are about. So we're going to document that to begin with by introducing methods for turning left and turning right. So let's extract a method here for turning right. And the name of the method is going to document what this code does. So right. Okay. I'm not quite sure why do you want to do that, but there we go. And let's run our tests. And now we'll rinse and repeat with this block of code, which is for turning left. So what we're doing here is we're, we're extracting methods to document what this block of code does, which is a very legitimate reason for extracting methods and constants and variables, is to document what, what that thing actually does or what it's for in our code, to make the code self-describing. Um, and this one is left, OK. Keep the original signature. Thank you very much. So we've, through the process of refactoring this internal design that we've been driving from the outside, we have extracted pieces of the jigsaw. So we ended up, when we did it from the inside out in the previous um, version, we kind of planned to have those pieces. Now what we're doing is we're discovering that we need them. In this case, we're discovering it to uh, answer the question, what does this block of code do and what does this block of code do? Well, this block of code turns right and that block of code turns left. So we've kind of solved the problem in our design there, made it self-documenting. Uh, we can go a little further here. So if we were to extract a method here, because we've got this very obvious, it's, it's identical code. So I think we don't even really need to see the pattern here. It's identical. So let's just call this turn. And it accepts as a parameter the compass, which describes the orientation. 
Let's do it for the other one as well. Clever old IntelliJ. Okay, so we got this turn method that does the actual business. Let's move that out of the way. Uh -huh. So our left and right are together. Notice how often I'm rerunning my test here. Every single refactoring, even just moving some code down in the file, um, I rerun my test. It's, it's good to run your test very often. Now, let's. Um, there's ways we can do these. For example, let's rename these. So I'm going to call that clockwise. So again, I'm, I'm getting the code to document itself here. And this one would be anti-clockwise. So now we're getting the code to describe itself, and in the process of doing that and removing some a little bit of duplication there, some very obvious duplication, we have discovered pieces of the internal jigsaw through that process of cleaning up the code, through the refactoring. And this is very much how the outside install of TDD tends to go. We drive our design from the highest level through the entry point to our little system here, and we discover the internal parts of the system through the process of refactoring the internal code, to break it down, to make it more readable, to remove duplication, and so on and so forth, so that we, an internal design emerges. Um, and the advantage of this approach is that because we're, we, we sort of create the whole jigsaw and then we break it down into its individual pieces, those individual pieces, because we cut them out of the whole, are guaranteed to fit and we're guaranteed to be giving the customer what they want because we're actually driving our tests entirely from that external perspective. So all of the internal parts are being discovered from a process that drives directly from what our customer is asking for. These are the meaningful tests that we talked about in the third video in this series about what kind of tests we should write. These are the meaningful tests. So this outside-in approach um, has some real advantages. Advantage number one, very importantly, is that we are discovering the internal design through the process of refactoring to make the code easy to understand, to remove duplication and uh, that kind of thing. And therefore, the pieces of the jigsaw are guaranteed to fit and we're driving it from the customer's perspective, from the customer's requirement. So we're, we're, we're pretty much guaranteed, as long as our refactorings don't break the code, we're pretty much guaranteed to end up with an internal design that gives the customer what they want. The second advantage, well, let's take a look. Inside our Rover class, left, right are not exposed. They're encapsulated. And if we continue and finish off this, um, this design, which I'll do in a minute, I'll pause the video and do that, what you will see is that a lot more of the internal design is hidden from the client code and hidden from the test code. So our tests are far more decoupled from the internal implementation, which gives us a lot more freedom when it comes to refactoring and rejigging and re-architecting that internal design. So two big advantages there, but it has one disadvantage. Now, for a problem this small, this is one class with just a handful of methods. It's not really a big deal. But if we were building a much more complex system, we would end up with lots of classes and lots of packages or layers, if you like, all of which would have their own distinct responsibilities. And if we were to drive all of our testing through the overall API, let's say, for example, this is a web service, and inside that web service there are hundreds of classes in lots of different packages or namespaces, if, if, depending on what language you're working in, um, then when one of these tests fail, you've not really got much of an idea of exactly where in the code it's gone wrong, where to look. The, uh, the metaphor I use is, um, let's imagine that um, someone comes to your house and checks the, the pressure of the gas supply to your house. And they check it at the entry point to your your house. So they check it, maybe you've got a gas meter outside the house, and they check to see if any pressure is being lost there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And let's um, imagine they find that there is a drop in pressure, and they go, 
there is there is a gas leak somewhere in your house it's somewhere in your house we can't tell you where but it's somewhere in the house now we might have to go into the house rip up floorboards rip out concrete if there's concrete on the floor rip out plaster from the walls and all sorts of things to try and figure out where in the house it's gone wrong at the very least it would be useful to know which room the gas leak is in which room in the house so the advantages of in outside in design are decoupling and you're guaranteed that the pieces will fit but a potential big disadvantage is that when these tests fail they're essentially just telling you there's a gas leak somewhere in your house and then you're going to end up spending a lot of time in the debugger going through the call stack trying to figure out but where has it gone wrong so advantages disadvantages to both approaches and in the um, the next video in the final video in this series what we're going to do is we're going to put everything together into an approach that has the advantages of outside in design but also some of the advantages of inside out design in terms of being able to more accurately pinpoint where things have gone wrong and the way that we're going to do that on complex multi-layered designs is using these things called test doubles um, stubs and mocks so the final video will all be about outside in design of complex multi-layered systems using stubs and mocks how do we scale up this approach how can we have our cake and eat it how can we get the advantages of both inside out and outside in design okay i'm going to pause the video here and i'm just going to finish this off and we'll see the final the final product okay so i've just finished this off so there are all our tests that are passing you'll notice there are no tests for mapping um, input characters to commands anymore because that's being implicitly tested by all of the tests because we're everything's being done through the same go method so our tests only know about that go method and the getters for checking the um, the, the, the direct direction it's facing in and, and the position it's in um, and if we look inside again we've got a few public methods here we've got a go method and a couple of getters there but the rest of it is now private. It's hidden from the test code. It's hidden from the client. So this is a great way to achieve better encapsulation. Okay, well, we've got one more video to go where we're going to put everything that we've learned so far together. And we're going to talk about how we scale up test-driven development using stubs and mocks.